Bonjour, Songi Benesi and Ine Chishnakas Kanu Totem. Hi, everybody, good evening. I'm really, really happy to be here today. Um, hello to everybody that's in the internet. Um, I'm really happy to see you or to have you here. Hello, <coughs> To all you agents in the room, you know who you are. <laughs> Just kidding, we set up the live stream so they could log in. Did not, not feel all uncomfortable. Today. <laughs> but anyway, no, I'm, I'm really happy to be here first and foremost. Um, uh, I want to recognize uh, the Ants territory, the ancestors of this territory, and as a Cree from northern Manitoba that's a guest in this territory, just to announce that I'll walk in respect and, of course, been fed so well uh, in Toronto always, <laughs> and we'll go home um, with a, a full spirit. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, share some, some observations, I guess. That's why we got invited here today. But I wanted to start first just by saying where I was when Occupy Wall Street went off. Like, I was uh, 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 asked by my director to go and represent our network um, at a gathering called the Grassroots Global Justice Alliance Congress. Uh, Grassroots Global Justice is a, a, a network of social movement organizations in the U.S. that is led by people of color and indigenous peoples. There's about 86 organizations that are working on everything from immigrant rights to uh, prison justice to you know, working with poverty issues, environmental and economic justice, anti-war organizing, women's rights. And, you know, we have come together and one of our main platforms at this meeting that my boss asked me to go to was we were coming together to figure out what is our organizing, our social movement organizing strategy and platform for this year, 2012 in the U.S. as people of color, as indigenous peoples. And the platform that we adopted at that gathering, it was in North Carolina, in uh, uh, Durham? No. Raleigh, Raleigh. <coughs> Raleigh, North Carolina. <coughs> cool town, go there if you ever get a chance. Um, was no war, no warming, build the people's economy. No war, no warming build the people's economy. Come on, say it. No war, no warming, build the people's economy. No war, no warming, build the people's economy. Yeah. Just leave it at that, let it simmer, okay? Just getting, just getting there. Now, so I'm sitting there in a room with like, you know, 200 people of color, indigenous peoples, most radical people that I've ever come across, you know, that are leading in every single city in the United States, you know, that are, are really trying to undo a lot of the isms, you know, that are facing racial oppression, that are facing gender oppression, you know, ageism, you know, heterosexism, all of these things, homophobia, you know, all in one room. And man, I was really humbled. I was like, damn, this is so cool. We're like, we're like, you know, we're like, we're like AIM. We're like, <laughs> of right now, that's us, holy shit. You know? And I was really excited about it. And I was like, damn, we're really gonna rock this shit this year, you know? Look at this crew. You know, kind of like the way I feel right now, you know, looking at all of you. Really inspiring. And um, all of a sudden, you know, because we're all techno geeks, I'm like sitting there like this and we're talking about something or other. I, I couldn't remember because I was on my phone looking at Twitter because Twitter started blowing up. And, I, and I'm like, holy shit. Wall Street's being occupied. Wow. And I'm like, hey, and I got on the mic, and I was like, hey, hey, everybody, did you guys realize there's thousands of people swarming on the Occupy right now? And everybody's look, pulls out their phones, and is like, holy smokes, yeah, you're right, wow. And I was like, who called this action? And, and everybody else in there was like, I don't know. And then somebody said, oh, wait a minute, I saw Adbusters put something out. And we're like, Adbusters? That art magazine? <laughs> And then somebody else said, no, no, that's anonymous. Yeah. And we're all like, who's anonymous? And everybody went. <laughs> <laughs> and 
all of us were really excited about what we were seeing. We're like, yeah, it's about time somebody goes onto Wall Street and, you know, does a blockade and creates some ruckus, reclaims that space. Hell yeah, woo! But then all of a sudden we're like, why aren't we there? <laughs> and, and then we were like, how come well, Ruckus Society, you, you guys are usually up on the action. Did you know anything about this shit? And the director of Ruckus was like, I didn't know anything about this shit. And then everybody else from the different organizations was kind of like, well, what the hell? You know? And we were like, well, who's on Wall Street right now? And then we started looking at the live feeds, because the live feeds started coming in, and it was all young, white, middle class youth, you know, from all kinds of different walks of life. Predominantly. There was like a couple black folks in there, maybe a couple Latino folks, and you know, but yeah, I didn't see any Indians. <laughs> no, I didn't see Indians. The 1491s went there later in Occupy. <laughs> you know, those people that are laughing know about the 1491s. <laughs> but the point is, is that, you know, uh, here I am at, at, at the premier congress of racialized communities gathering to talk about how we were gonna utilize the limited power, um, you know, the limited resource power, but the infinite people power and spiritual power and just, you know, uh, a resiliency that we have in the year 2012. How are we gonna do that? And none of us knew a damn thing about this action in, on, Wall, or in, on Wall Street, you know, that day about, you know, what, six, seven months ago or whatever time it was. And that was, that, that troubled me. It really did. You know, I, I, it really bothered me. I was kind of like, well, what the hell? And everybody else, too, was like, what the hell? And then we were like, are we just feeling insecure? And, and like, you know, should we feel okay about this? Like, because we weren't involved? Like, you know, who's leading this? These are all our questions. Because most of us come from a framework of social movement organizing where we are accountable to our base, okay? All of us were there with constituencies, you know, uh, we have a base of our grassroots people that we're accountable to that tell us, you know, uh, what to do, you know, how we're going to move forward and we move forward collectively, all right? And so we were all kind of like, well, what the hell? Who, you know, who is this base and who's, who's the leadership of this base? How come we're not communicating with them? How do we get a hold of them? And there were some folks that called some folks and then figured out, you know, the, who was on the Occupy Organizing Committee in New, community in New York real quick. And was like, oh, I know that person. They do some cool work here and there. Um, but it was, it was pretty abstract, I guess I would say. And for all of us, you know, we were not just indigenous uh, people that were in the room, but all the, you know, the, 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 the Asian Pacific, uh, all the black folks, all the, all, the, all, the, all the Latin American folks were like, were like, wow, this is bizarre. And, we, you know, we really didn't know how to deal with it. And so... You know, my first reaction, I guess I would say, and I'll own this just for myself, was this, I was I was afraid. You know, looking at it from the position that I have as an organizer with IEN, running our Tar Sands campaign, you know, doing everything I can to work with incredible organizers like the good folks from EJ Toronto, what? NOI Toronto, you know, and every other organization that that IEN's collaborated with in the city of Toronto and other urban centers that you know we've worked in to build a climate of solidarity for frontline land-based struggles. I was like, oh damn. Ah, oh, geez. This is an interesting thing. I wonder what's gonna happen. Because I knew, you know, just like everybody else, that the world is in a very serious situation of change. That the Arab Spring was spreading, that there was something happening, that technology played a part in that, and just general People are pissed off about, you know, the economic collapse. And, and, you know, so for me, I started worrying because I was like, well, shit, is all of our solidarity people that we rely on, you know, to really support uh, interventions to these evil corporations that we're fighting against in urban centers and places like Toronto on Bay Street, are they going to get sucked away now into this stuff, you know, if this shit spreads, you know? What's that going to do? And... Um, you know, and I actually had a couple conversations about it when I got back from North Carolina. You know, I, I came here to Toronto for some event, and, and I, I, I talked with, I think, Dave Vazzi and a couple other people uh, about it, and just expressed some of my fears that this Occupy movement, if not handled correctly, had the potential to set up a scenario where 
a lot of our social movements, existing social movements that have been gaining a lot of power lately through good, resilient leadership from local frontline communities supported by hardcore solidarity uh, movements that are rooted in anti-colonial, anti-racist, anti-oppression frameworks. You know, there's some big shit that's gone down in the last couple of years, you know, and some really great work. And I said, I'm afraid that if, if, if we don't find a way to deal with this huge influx of activists, of radicalized, recently radicalized people who for the most part have never been exposed to social movements, who for the most part have no idea about the history of the civil rights movement or Black Panthers or Red Power or you know, American Indian Movement or, you know, or, 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 or even more contemporary stuff that's been happening. You know, if we don't, if we don't have a solid group of like, like a whole army of anti-racist trainers, you know, to like deal with these people. All, all of our people are going to experience a whole shitload of lateral violence. Because these people don't know how to check their white privilege at the door. Yeah. And, and so, you know, and then the emails started coming. Because I, you know, I, I operate in, in, in multiple countries as, as a coordinator of an international campaign dealing with you know, dozens of corporations that are operating in northern Alberta. Um, the emails started coming in from Denver, from Oakland, from LA, from Santa Fe, from Albuquerque, you know, from the southeast US, Miami, from, from, uh, from uh, DC, from New York City, about the crazy ass shit that was happening that was like, you know, just people who were not educated, had no experience organizing in a people's assembly, um, using a mic check system, all these different things, you know, that, that basically in every single city there were crews of predominantly, you know, white dudes who were dominating and not allowing, you know, women of color, indigenous women, and then other, you know, everybody else, the space that we have become accustomed to in our own spaces. Okay, and not recognizing the importance of having, you know, if we're going to truly challenge the power and, and create systemic change of why it's so important for communities to speak for themselves, of why it's so important for, you know, lifting up and elevating the most disproportionately affected by all of these problems we face to the forefront of the movement. Why that's so important, and why it's so important with people with privilege, whether it's male privilege, or racial privilege, or privilege of being older, or privilege of being hella rich, of taking a step back, you know? Why that's so important. And so, you know, it all kind of basically came true. Like, everything that I was, I was kind of concerned about, you know, initial observations. And, I, and the one thing that kind of rang true through all of it for me was that, you know, a native person sure as hell didn't come up for the name of this exciting <laughs> And it sure as hell wasn't a Palestinian person. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, you know, I, I just wanted to put that out there to y'all because, you know, it's indigenous perspective. So I wanted to give you my, kind of what happened when I seen all this stuff going down. And then I had the opportunity later on to be in Washington, D.C. for some event uh, related to the Keystone XL campaign, which we just got Obama to reverse the presidential permit, you know? The key battle in the war against big oil. Yes, I know, the Republicans are trying to make a thing, but, you know, the, it was a battle won. The war's not over. So. Um, but I was in D.C. and we went down to the Occupy space and, and it, you know, I, it was a lot different than I expected it to be. Um, you know, it, I, I really don't know what to say about it other than it was a little awkward for me personally when I went to the Occupy space. Um, we didn't really know where we stood and we didn't really know how to, how to engage with the crew I was with. You know, we just kind of stood on the sideline and watched. And, you know, and then when I came to Occupy in Toronto, um, you know, it was a lot of the same thing. I really didn't know how to engage aside from, um, you know, in a meaningful way, aside from just uh, supporting, you know, people, people like uh, Dave and others, you know, there's a million of you in the room that were, you know, created this community, you know. 
um, I was really I was really proud of everybody with what they were doing. I never went to the space in Ottawa to be honest with you. That's where I live. But when I'm in Ottawa, I'm with my kids. That's it. You know, I don't I don't I, I'm I'm kind of I disappear. You know, I'm just with my babies and my wife. But um, but the one thing that I did I did give feedback to the people in Toronto um, that I was concerned about was the fact that what I observed was a huge influx of a, of, of, of a situation that folks I don't think were ready to deal with. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to some observations on the structure <clears throat> and, and the best use of social movements that are you know, converging you know, into what is essentially the biggest social movement in the history of mankind. One of the observations I made was holding permanent space like that um, you know, really set up a lot of folks that I don't think we're capable of or trained to or equipped to or qualified even to deal with. One of them, of course, was, you know, uh, uh, I observed a lot of folks that had, you know, that had mental health needs, you know, support needs, homelessness, people with severe uh, addictions issues, and in some cases, people with all three of those things going on, but at a high level. Mm. And I, I honestly felt, you know, and I gave feedback to the organizers. I'm like, you can't guarantee, you can't guarantee safety for the community here. Mm. Like when IEM comes together for our Protecting Mother Earth conference, which is the mechanism that we utilize to, to for all of our base to come together to inform the organization, the staff, and the board about key direction forward for how best IEM can serve, you know, the environmental justice movement of our native communities here in Turtle Island. We got straight up security, you know. There's no alcohol, no drugs. Mm -hmm. We have sweat lodges, you know, we have sacred fire. Mm -hmm. There is clear uh, 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 teams on that stuff that are, you know, and if people don't, don't abide by the, the collective agreements of those rules, then they're removed. And, and I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. but it's important when you build community to be able to provide safety in that community. And if safety cannot be guaranteed then there's a problem there. And there's liabilities there too from a very general surface, shallow perspective. There's liabilities. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to give that observation out there in, in a respectful and humble way. Um, and I also, well, in the same breath, just want to say though, it was really damn cool to see the infrastructure that did come together. And it was amazing. Um, so that's just, you know, take that as you will. Um, so just going back to the structure though, you know, as IEN in our Tar Sands campaign, we've had the privilege of doing some pretty good work, and, and this is what I'm going to kind of conclude on. Um, we've had the privilege of really doing some cool work with different crews all over the planet. Uh, part of our Tar Sands work over the last few years has brought us to the UK because we decided that while well, the government of Canada is not listening, the government of America is not listening, well at least they weren't back then, um, and you know, <laughs> and so and these fucking oil companies, you know what? They're gonna screw with us in our territories. We're gonna go to their territories and screw with them. And so we went over to London and we we screwed with BP and we're gonna screw with them some more. Um, and you know we we hooked up with Climate Camp in the UK, which was the, you know one of the things that I wanted to share with everybody in Occupy was Climate Camp, the UK Climate Justice Movement, Rising Tide, all those crews over there, they had this really amazing model um, that they utilized for mass convergence, you know, and to take out their targets. And what they called it was the Climate Camp for Climate Action. We had one here in Canada uh, over at, in, uh, where was that, Brett? Dunham. Dunham, you know, last summer. It was small, you know, but, you know, it was a seed that was planted. But the point that I'm getting at is that as social movements, we have, to, we have to recognize that, you know, we have limited resources. We also have to recognize the realities of the spaces that we're working in and understand, too, um, that, that, that there are existing social movements that are already at play. And so when there's a new thing that pops up like this, because, um, you know, I can't speak for the rest of the panel, but I was inundated from every region, from people who really got into Occupy with them saying, oh, stop being like that. Just, for, can't you just, like, forget about it? You know, come on, just give it a chance to grow. You know, the Occupy thing, yeah, yeah, you semantics, man, semantics. But fuck that. Okay? No, seriously. Screw that. All right? <laughs> Occupy is offensive. That's like you trying to tell me, like, oh, come on now. The show's called Prairie Nigger, but it's okay. I know you're from the prairies and you're native, but it's okay. Okay, it's semantics, man. You know, and I know that's 
abrasive as hell, but I really want y'all to get what I'm trying to say here. The fact of the matter is, is that when we have convergence, we have to make sure that we do not solve racism, not solve you know uh, 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 male dominance and all of these these isms. But we have to develop the mechanisms to ensure that when we have convergence, that we're not creating a situation that's going to harm a bunch of people. All right. And if a bunch of people are getting harmed, then that's a fucked up strategy. And we, we got to let that go. I'm sorry. Um, and so, just to, in terms of the climate camp, what they used to do is they take a 10 month chunk of time. And that's what I see as being an interesting opportunity for Occupy, is they took 10, 10 days, okay, planned it all year, picked their target, and that's where thousands of people from across London converged. By thousands, I mean five, six, seven, eight thousand people seizing a space, setting up camp, building an ecologically sustainable community of composting toilets, you know, to, you know, crews going out dumpster diving, reclaiming food, you know, freaking uh, making smoothies with bicycle powered freaking blenders, uh, you know, workshop spaces, big marquees for plenaries, direct action trainings, people learning how to set up tripods, do tripod actions, all kinds of amazing things. And then every single day going out, uh, every single day, going out and doing actions. They have their targets. And so the one we participated in, we had 10 climate criminals that we picked in the London Square Mile, London's financial district. Ours was BP. And you know what? The whole camp got mobilized. We trained up all week, developed our materials, our signage, and we freaking occupied, for lack of a better word, BP, you know? And we went and rocked them, and it was amazing, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was an effective week, and when it was done, we let the space go, but we left it exactly how we went there, all right? Like, perfect, right to a T, not one piece of garbage. Just like, you know, just like my mama taught me when I go out in the bush, you know? We left it just like that. You couldn't even tell we were there, all right? And this happens all the time there, um, you know, every single year. There's, there's climate camp for action. And so I think something like that um, is something I just wanted to leave all of you, that, you know, we can take space um, and hold it and use it for, for the benefit of it, but I also think that we have to not sacrifice the inertia of the, of, of the movements that are already happening, because I guess, I don't have a solution, but what I'll put out to all of you is that, you know, a lot of folks got burnt holding that space. And, you know, we, we, we were still helping people in the tar sands. And we came and asked, you know, hey, folks, you got time for this and that in Toronto or, or Vancouver or, in, in all in the states with other EJ fights that we were involved in, and folks were caught up. Like the people that we usually work with on a solidarity level, all the non-native networks, they were caught up on that Occupy stuff. And they were doing conflict resolution, dealing with like violent people, um, you know, who weren't, who weren't necessarily at fault. They were, you know, either, uh, uh, you know, they had mental, mental health uh, support needs and stuff. And, you know, I just, I just, and of course the police all added to it because they're like, oh yeah, we, we'll stay out of the camp. <laughs> You know, and <laughs> I'm just giving some observations here, though. Um, but I will just say, so for next steps, though, you know, I think that for, for, for us at IEN, and Tom will talk about, about how we, inter how we um, helped in our own way from on the U.S. side of things with Occupy. Um, um, but, you know, we did, we did give some feedback, you know, to folks in the United States as well. And there was a whole, a whole a whole thing about decolonize, you know, and what Leanne talked about in terms of lifting up, you know, our indigenous women at the forefront of any strategy uh, to break down the system and, and really build up something that services our people and really the whole sacred circle of life, you know, is really rooted, if a, for lack of a better English word, in the word decolonize, you know, in my whole history as an activist in my, in my young life, you know, it started with that word. You know, the Native Youth Movement in 1994, 93, you know, that, that was the first place I heard it. I was just this little gangster in Winnipeg, and I met these radical kids who were like, you need to decolonize your mind. <laughs> and I, was like, <laughs> I was like, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> but I learned what it meant. I learned yeah. what it meant. You know, it meant undoing the harm that had been brought into my mind, into my heart, and into my spirit by these messed up colonial policies, you know, and this screwed up power dynamic in the society we're living by undoing it. 
And it wasn't just a native thing. Everybody in Canada, whether you're oppressed or you're an oppressor, everybody in Canada feels really screwed up about what happened with native people. That's why this series on CBC, Eighth Fire, is airing right now. Anybody watching Eighth Fire? Eighth Fire? Eighth Fire, CBC, every Tuesday night. You need to be watching this show, people! <laughs> no, no. I know probably all of you don't watch TV, but I know a lot of you are on the internet. And all the shows are on online. CBC's website online. It's hosted by my little brother, Wab Canoe. It's amazing. February 2nd, Tar Sands Campaign, Yinka Dene Alliance, Enbridge Gateway Fight is going to be profiled. If you're going to, if there's one night of the year, all you, all you Luddites don't want to watch TV, you watch it on February 2nd to, to catch that show. Can I stream it? Uh, yeah, you can stream it. 